Good evening. How are you doing? I would like to wel <laughs> thank you. I would like to welcome you to an exciting evening in our Krasno event series. My name is Klaus Laris. I'm the Richard uh, M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And tonight we are very pleased that Distinguished Ambassador Christopher Hill uh, has uh, come and joined us and will talk about uh, North Korea and the Trump administration. It's a great pleasure for you to, uh, to have you here. I'm also very pleased that our Dean, um, uh, Professor Colorado Mansfeld, is here and he will later introduce uh, the ambassador to you in a, a minute or two. Let me just uh, mention to you that I would like to remind you of our mailing list. Please fill in the mailing list if you're not yet on it. You know, I would like to inundate you with future events. <laughs> Then I would also mention that we, as you know, we are videotaping all our events. They are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com Krasno UNC. And the last events we, has ha we have had are already up. And uh, today's event will be up in a few days' time as well. I would also like to point out that we don't just um, tape the main event tonight, but that after this event I always conduct a five-minute interview with our speakers. So if you would like to see the condensed version of that one and a, uh, one and a half hours long version, then please uh, go to the YouTube channel and look at our five-minute insight series. That is where these short uh, um, interviews can be found. This week we have two exciting events. Today there's Christopher Hill, Ambassador Christopher Hill, and on Thursday we have the Irish Ambassador coming, and the Irish Ambassador will talk about Brexit, Ireland and the EU, another exciting and of course controversial topic. Um, as I said before, it's great to have Ambassador Christopher Hill here today. Uh, Christopher came uh, with me to my class on U.S. foreign relations this afternoon, and we had a great time. He uh, makes an excellent academic teacher, so we may ask him bet, uh, back to do some teaching. As you know, um, we are running a bit of a shoestring operation here. So while the din dean is kind enough to always give us enough money so that we just about manage to survive, but, uh, <laughs> but, but in order to get people like Christopher Hill, who is very much in demand, next week he's going to uh, Korea, last week he was in California, so it's great to have him that he could squeeze us in between all these many important events. So to uh, enable us to make sure that we can uh, get speakers uh, of his quality, we need your help. So if you feel like donating to us, of being generous and uh, supporting us, then please talk to me or go to our website where you find a, a page for donations as well. I thought I'd better bring that in so that you know it's, uh, though it's free here, but we still have to find uh, the funding to run it. Um, thanks again for Ambassador Hill for coming here today, and I would now like to hand over to uh, our uh, associate, Senior Associate Dean for Social Sciences and Global Programs, uh, Professor Rudy Colorado Mansfeld, who will introduce the Ambassador. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Klaus. Um, so yes, welcome. It's terrific that you're all here, and you always are here. This is one of the better attended lecture series on campus. And I want to just start actually talking a little bit about that. Um, we find ourselves in transitional times. Just the topics this week of the lectures signal that. Uh, and it's not just a question of the unsettling new protagonists on the global stage, the non-state actors, new media and digital <coughs> connectivity, realignments of global power. It's also the new instability in our international institutions that are undergoing a particular challenge at this moment. So the Krasno Global Affairs and Business Council is putting together increasingly high profile events so that we may better grasp all of this. In, in uh, Professor Laris's words, it's the driving forces, the fears and ideas, as well as the personalities that shape our age that we come into this room to learn about. 
And in that, I really want to credit all of you, actually, who are sitting here right now, because you are really important part of what is happening with this uh, series. And it is the strength of this community that is being built um, by you and by Professor Laris that actually allows me and the college to do more for this gathering and for this group. Uh, the participation, the uh, views that we get on YouTube, the interest in all of this has been I've been able to support this at a higher level. Uh, and there is really uh, no more urgent gathering and series uh, than this one for me right now. So Ambassador Christopher Hill graduated from Bowdoin College with a BA in economics, and he received a master's degree from the Naval War College in 1994. He speaks Polish, Serbo-Croatian, and Macedonian. And prior to joining the Foreign Service, Ambassador Hill served as a Peace Corps volunteer where he supervised credit unions in rural Cameroon in West Africa. And I told him I was going to mention all of this because I said there are a lot of young people in this room, some of whom are studying in economics, some are probably carrying around Peace Corps applications, and that you should realize that that will lead to great things if you are doing both of those things together. Ambassador Hill is a former career diplomat, a four-time ambassador, whose last post was as ambassador to Iraq in April 2009 until August 2010. Prior to Iraq, Ambassador Hill served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2005 until 2009 during which he was also the head of the U.S. delegation to the six-party talks on the North Korean nuclear issue. Earlier, he was the, the U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Korea, and previously he served as U.S. ambassador to Poland in 2000 and 2004, ambassador to the Republic of Macedonia, 1996 to 1999, and the special envoy to Kosovo in 1998 to 1999. And for all this, for his contributions as a member of the U.S. negotiating team to the Bosnia Peace Settlement, Ambassador Hill received the State Department's Distinguished Service Award and was a recipient of the Robert S. Frischer Award for Peace Negotiations for his work on the Kosovo Crisis. Uh, he's also an author recently of the book Outpost, Life on the Front Lines of American Diplomacy, a memoir, and he's currently serving in the role as Chief Advisor to the, and Chancellor for Global Engagement, uh, Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy at the University of Denver. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's uh, very, very kind of you to go through my resume like that and uh, to acknowledge uh, how many years have passed by since those Peace Corps days. Uh, but uh, Rudy, I'm really glad you mentioned the Peace Corps because people always say, what was the most important job you had in the Foreign Service? And my inclination is always to tell them Peace Corps because, you know, first, first of all, they gave me a Suzuki 125 dirt bike, learned to ride a motorcycle. Secondly, you know, you go out there and you're some, in some little village in the middle of nowhere, in, um, in this case, Cameroon, and people are, you know, a, year, uh, a month before that, I was, um, you know, playing Frisbee on the, uh, the main lawn at Bowdoin College, and now I was having people come up to me with their life savings and making sure it was all there and showing me the numbers that they didn't really understand and making sure that that's exactly what was held in the accounts in the credit union. So it was, quite, it was quite a daunting task to be responsible for the life savings of all these villagers, multiplied by 28. I had 28 of these little uh, credit unions. And I think for any uh, person coming out of college, it's a, you, know, you, you learn a lot of responsibility when people depend on you. And uh, it was just a, just a great experience. And uh, I really hope that uh, some people in the audience will, will think about that. Um, today, however, I'm going to talk about the uh, always cuddly, only a mother can love North Koreans. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I spent, I spent four years dealing with these people, and, uh, and I thought it might be a good occasion maybe to go through, you know, where we are now, how we got here, and where we're likely uh, to go. But um, before I do that, I wanted to mention a story from uh, Poland. Rudy mentioned that I had been ambassador in Poland. Well, way before my time in Poland, 
uh, as ambassador, there was a, a Polish party first secretary named Władysław Gomułka, uh, a name otherwise kind of lost to history. And uh, Władysław Gomułka, the party first secretary, is about 1956 to 1964. And uh, he was uh, known for giving very long speeches uh, and not very successful metaphors. And, and one day he stood up in front of a big crowd in, uh, in Kraków, uh, southern Polish city of Kraków, and said to, said to this crowd, um, comrades, just a few years ago, our fatherland stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I'm here to tell you today, comrades, that we have taken an important step forward. <laughs> and, and so, I think uh, in light of the wisdom of Władysław Gomułka, I'm sure he's looking down on us right now, because I don't think his name gets mentioned too often in contemporary Poland. But uh, there is a value to uh, actually stepping back and seeing where you're going and to asking the question whether this is the right way to go. Um, obviously, in dealing with North Korea, it didn't just start with this president. It didn't just start with uh, President Obama or with President Bush, who um, uh, famously had put uh, uh, North Korea in something called the axis of evil. There are a lot of people who say that was so offensive to them, they went out and made nuclear weapons in response. Actually, they've been making nuclear weapons or working on it really since the late 60s. It's been something, it's been a sort of national dedication in, uh, in North Korea to acquire weapons of mass destruction. And I think we have to be, try to come up with a, with a, at least a hypothesis on why they're doing this. Because I think if we don't do that, if we assume we understand or worse yet, if we believe what they're telling us as to why they have nuclear weapons, the tendency will be to try to give them something in response or some assurances to make them feel that somehow um, uh, their, their concerns have been met, therefore they'll give up their nuclear weapons. There's an old line in, uh, in psychology to the effect you can never give someone enough of what they don't really want. And I think uh, we may be in that situation in North Korea, and let me explain. For many people, and for the North Koreans especially, they say, why do they need nuclear weapons? Because they need to deter a United States attack. I submit to you, the United States has never threatened North Korea. It is true that after the Incheon landing and the Pusan breakout, those of you who know Korean War, the Korean War know, know that the North Koreans attacked South Korea in, two, in 1950, on June 25th, 1950. By the way, they even dispute that fundamental fact that North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel and attacked uh, South Korea on that day. They came down s south. Many people from Seoul fled, but unfortunately the bridges were, uh, were blown before many people were, to get it, were uh, able to get out. So many people had to suffer under the North Koreans north of Seoul. But the North Koreans soon were over the, over the, uh, the, the uh, Han River and were down to uh, what was called the Pusan perimeter, sort of the area of the, north, uh, of the south uh, uh, east of, uh, of Korea. And at that, of South Korea. And at that point, we, we brought in forces. And it wasn't a gimme to even bother doing this, but we had a pretty intrepid president at the time, uh, Harry Truman, who said, no, we're not going to allow them to get, a, get away with this. So he brought in forces from Japan. They brought in forces from other places. Many people, known at the time, by the way, as two-time losers, that is, people who served in World War II and were called up to serve in Korea. And uh, I think for many of those people for, for whom it's a forgotten war and not forgotten by them because they suffered and, their, and many of their, their compatriots died in that war, but they were brought in. And then the Americans did an amazing thing. Uh, Douglas MacArthur, who I think if you look at recent history, historians have kind of noted a lot of mistakes he's made, and there's no question he made mistakes. But he did a very good thing in September uh, 1950. 
he landed forces up in a, in a place called Incheon. Now today an Incheon landing happens about every 20 seconds. That's where the main airport is uh, for uh, Seoul. But in those days, he took forces on a 17-foot tide and brought them in at the crest of that tide and brought in uh, Marines, caught the, uh, the North Korean forces completely unaware, at which point uh, forces uh, along the Pusan perimeter broke out. And before you know it, we had taken the entire uh, North Korean army. And then, in a, in, a, uh, in a further move, and a move that was not entirely uh, approved, although it's uh, a bit of a myth that he completely violated his orders, MacArthur wheeled north and went up and had forces up in the Yalu, and by the which is on the Chinese border. And by the time they started seeing uh, Chinese troops around Thanksgiving time, around the uh, end of October, beginning of November, so a little before Thanksgiving, they started seeing Chinese forces. And before they knew it, they had, uh, the Chinese were in in force, a couple of million, a million men for something called a volunteer army. And they drove the Americans all the way south, past the uh, uh, 38th parallel, through Seoul again. So Seoul, which had been taken by the North Koreans, retaken by the Americans, taken by the Chinese, and then drove American forces uh, down to what is today a line near an American air base called Osan. And at that point, the Americans made a stand. Uh, MacArthur was, uh, was actually withdrawn by Truman, gutsy move by Truman to withdraw just this heroic uh, five-star five general. He brought in a guy named Matt Ridgway who drove the Chinese up and we stood at the 38th parallel and that's where it's been ever since. And I mention that because we have never hinted to anybody that we want to go north of the 38th parallel. We have never said this is our objective to retake North Korea by arms. You've heard people say we want regime change in North Korea. We have never talked about invading North Korea. So when the North Koreans say we want to invade them or we want to somehow drop nuclear weapons on them, I think you, it's a fair question to ask the North Koreans, show me your evidence that we've ever wanted to do that. And the answer is we don't. So now the question is, so why do they want these nuclear weapons? And I submit to you, it's not to ward off an American attack on North Korea, an attack that somehow we should uh, assure them that we're not going to make by, say, offering to do a peace treaty with them or make some other uh, offer to them really in the absence of any indication that we were intending to do something in the first place. And so um, I think it is a valid question, why do, the North, why do the North Koreans want these nuclear weapons? And I submit to you it's for a different reason. Now last year, you recall, uh, we had a lot of discussions about would there be a war? I mean, many Americans were, uh, you know, contemplating surviving their families coming over for, uh, you know, uh, in their homes for Christmas. And now, now Mar many Americans were being asked to, you know, figure out how to survive a nuclear war. We were all talking about nuclear war by December. In fact, I think what, was, what the North Koreans have in mind is they want us to understand that if there is some pushing and shoving on the Korean Peninsula, if there's a situation where North Korean forces become engaged with, with South Korean forces, and if at that point, per our defense treaty, our alliance with the South Koreans, the U.S. goes, okay, we're in, we're in. We're gonna help our South Korean allies. And if we come in, the North Koreans say, wait a minute, Americans, because we have missiles pointed at you, and if you want to engage in this conflict, you will be a part of this conflict, and we will fire, fire mi missiles at you. Let's say Los Angeles. Well, I mean, you could say, look, that is utterly ridiculous. I mean, the North Koreans know if they try to launch a firecracker toward Los Angeles, we would hit them so hard they would never know what happened to them. Or would they? Would the, do you really want to count on complete rationality from the North Koreans on the question of would they hit us in the, in the knowledge that we might hit them? Is that how they're going to think about this and therefore they would never attack us? Is that a calculation you want to make? Or are you going to think in the longer term, whether this administration or the next administration or the next administration, and think, you know, the South Koreans, 
That is one of the most powerful forces in the world, and anyone who knows South Korean military knows they are capable. They are totally capable. Uh, they are probably more capable than most of our NATO allies, even with the 2%. We won't get into that. Uh, so, uh, so I could see, I think anyone could see a future American president say, you know, we don't really need these forces in the Korean Peninsula. I mean, after all, South Korea is almost twice as big as North Korea in terms of its, uh, the number of, uh, of uh, tru uh, troops, the number, the number of, uh, not the number of troops, but the, uh, the population, et cetera, far more powerful country. We really don't need to be here, do we? And so before you know it, there could be a kind of sense that, gee, we don't need to be there. And then we start saying, you know, South Koreans, we're with you, we'll always be with you, but we don't really need these forces on the peninsula. We have about 28,000 of them. And therefore, maybe we could uh, relocate them elsewhere. And you recall during the start of the Iraq War, or, or actually in the middle or the muddle of the Iraq War back in uh, 2005, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld at the time was saying to the South Koreans, you know, I'm not sure we really need all these forces there, and we might need them in Iraq, so we're just going to take them out of, out of South Korea, and that's when we drop down to 28,000. So imagine you start withdrawing forces from South Korea, and the South Koreans often don't feel they have much say in the matter. They do like to be informed, and we'll get to that in a, in a bit. So the South Koreans might say something like, well, you know, okay, but you'll, you'll still be our ally in case we need you. Oh yeah, we'll be your ally. But we just need, don't need forces there. So we pull our forces out of South Korea. Again, it's not gonna happen today or tomorrow. It's something over time. And then Japan starts wondering, do we wanna be the only country in Asia to have permanently assigned troops, US troops in our country? Do we really wanna be that? Uh, you can imagine you're a Japanese prime minister, a few years down the road, and you turn to your aide and say, How, who, other, who else has permanent U.S. Uh, force deployments in their country? Well, sir, we're the only one. They, they're here in, uh, in Japan, in Okinawa. And how long have they been here? Maybe the Japanese uh, prime minister a few years from now won't know his history and might ask, well, how long have they been there? Well, sir, they've been here since uh, 1945. Why did they come in 1945? Well, they were here to occupy us, sir. <laughs> so we have American forces who have been occupying us since 1945, and we're the only country in Asia with us? Do we really want that? I mean, that looks kind of strange. Shouldn't we be increasing our own forces? Shouldn't we be telling the Americans we want to keep the alliance, but this is a little embarrassing to be the only country in Asia with forces? And so you can imagine, uh, at some point, U.S. forces not being wanted or not being appreciated and being moved out of Japan. This is all long-term stuff, and uh, I think for many people it looks like science fiction. But getting back to what the North Koreans are thinking, they would like to use nuclear weapons to get us out of the Korean Peninsula and maybe get us even further. Now, who else shares this view? Take China, for example. I have no doubt that China would like uh, North Korea to denuclearize. They've said it a million times. They agree with us always on the issue of denuclearization. Would China like our forces to stay in the Korean Peninsula? Not so sure about that. If I were, China, if I were a Chinese, kind of a hardline Chinese type, party type in Beijing, I'm not talking about the business community in Shanghai who would like to throw North Korea under a bus and never hear the name North Korea again. I'm talking about the party types in Beijing. Do they want U.S. troops there in, uh, on the Korean Peninsula? If you're a Chinese, uh, kind of hard type politics, uh, hard uh, communist type, do you really want to see a situation where what if the U.S. and South Korea put so much pressure on North Korea, whether sanctions, whether whatever, and North Korea collapses? And then you have uh, a successor state. What's a successor state? That would be South Korea. So you have a U.S. ally on your border, potentially a U.S. ally with U.S. troops in it. Would you want that? Now, a lot of the U.S. newspapers have made the point that China doesn't want to have North Korean refugees coming into China. I mean, you know, China's a tiny country of 1.4 billion people. How could they ever handle uh, North Korean refugees? Well, 
first of all, North Korean refugees, they may have North Korean made compasses, but they would figure out how to go south, not north, that I want to assure you about. And secondly, as the numbers implied, China could handle North Korean refugees. This is not about refugees. This is about a concern from the Chinese that if you have a united Korean peninsula, and if it's a U.S. ally, and if it has U.S. forces in it, what assurances do they have that the U.S. wouldn't put up a string of listening posts on the, uh, on the uh, Yalu River? What assurances would they have that, in fact, instead of Osan Air Base, it might be an air base up in, uh, uh, up in North Korea? So the Chinese would start to worry about the presence of a U.S. Of, uh, a US ally on their border. Now, maybe you could make some assurances to them. Maybe you could say, don't worry, Chinese, we'd never put troops up on the Yalu River. Uh, we would never try to uh, hurt your security posture uh, in exercising our responsibilities to our South Korean ally. Don't, don't worry about it, China. We'll be, we'll, we can work that out. Then they look at us and wonder, well, maybe this president will work it out, but what's the next president going to say about that? Maybe he would want to put uh, U.S. forces up in the Yalu. Or if you're, if you're China, you might be thinking, this has nothing to do whether U.S. troops are there or not there. You have a very delicate game going on within China between people who want to reform a lot more than they have reformed, let me put it that way, and then people who, want to, who don't want to reform. And how would the uh, decline and fall of a neighboring Marxist state, how would that affect that the balance of political forces within China? Because I can assure you the, the collapse of North Korea would not be greeted indifferently in terms of Chinese domestic uh, uh, concerns. There'd be a lot of people worried that if North Korea goes down, we're next. Now, you could certainly make the point, look, North Korea, I mean, this hideous Stalinist regime has nothing to do with this WTO member, uh, China. But in fact, when you're a Chinese leadership and you have no process of, uh, you have no elections and a uh, process of legitimacy through elections, you worry about stuff like this. So I mention all of these things as a precursor to how complex this issue is. So I think U.S. policy has been pretty solid over the years. We back our, our Korean allies to the hilt. We keep a close relationship with Japan. If we ever get into a, a, a shooting war in Korea, we have a relationship with Japan where we can start flowing forces in from there. We flow forces in from Texas, from North Carolina, into Japan. We stage them there. We go into southern South Korea. We're all set in that regard. We, we, we have this whole, this whole long-term long -term approach. So the question is, though, what, how are we going to deal with this threat to our interests in the form of nuclear weapons? So several presidents have taken, have taken a run at this. Pre during President Clinton's time, there was something called the Agreed Framework. And this was to say to the North Koreans, and by the way, a lot of great people worked on this, and I am not uh, a critic of anyone who's worked on these issues in the past. So the idea was to say to the, uh, to the um, North Koreans, okay, what do you want? Why do you want to have this nuclear capacity? Well, North Korea says, well, we just have some uh, dirty coal. We don't have any oil supplies. We need it for energy. So the, uh, what's their answer? So the Clinton administration said, okay, what if we take down this so-called graphite moderated reactor which is what the Yongbyon reactor complex is. Uh, by the way, the main South Korean ski resort is Yongpyong. Uh, the main North Korean nuclear place is Yongbyon. They're different kind of places. But, uh, so the idea was they take down the Yongbyon graphite-moderated uh, uh, plutonium reactor. And just a 10-second uh, nuclear uh, um, uh, lecture. There are two ways to a bomb. One is through plutonium, where you have a reactor, you take spent fuel rods, you put it into something called a plutonium processing facility, you get plutonium, and that becomes your main ingredient in a bomb. 
or you have centrifuges somewhere, maybe 200 centrifuges, you run them, at a, it's very tough to do, but people have mastered it, and you take uh, uranium and you make it enriched, and you enrich it to 90%, and then you have fuel for, for, uh, for uh, uranium-based bombs. Uh, Nagasaki was uranium, uh, Hiroshima was plutonium. We had both ways to the bomb. This is important, because I'll explain where the North Koreans have been coming on this. So the Clinton administration said, OK, you take down your, uh, your uh, graphite-moderated reactor, a reactor where very easy to convert the spent fuel rods into plutonium. Take it all down, destroy it, and we will, together with allies in the region, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, we will put two, not one, but two light water reactors. Uh, and these light water reactors, which are more difficult to convert the spent fuel into, a, into uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons fuel, they will provide all the energy you need from there. So that was the plan. So uh, something called Kado, uh, uh, which was this uh, Korean uh, uh, peninsula plan uh, where Japan participated, the US participated, South Korea participated, and other countries actually were involved in that. And so what they did was they came in and started the plans to make a, uh, a light two light water reactors in North Korea. By the end of uh, 2009, I'm sorry, by the end of 1999, the Clinton administration noticed something in the intelligence reports. And that was that North Korea was making purchases of various equipment that was consistent with a desire to create a, uh, uh, centrif a, centrif uh, a uranium-based bomb, just call it that. So uh, the question was in front of the Clinton administration, do we stop what we're doing on the plutonium that is shutting down this very dangerous uh, graphite moderated reactor because they, uh, we see that there are signs that they're trying to work a bomb through another means, through the uranium, or do we keep going and trying to collapse this, uh, this uh, uh, plutonium effort? The answer was they decided to keep going. But when the Bush administration came in, the Clinton administration said to the Bush administration, you should know there are these intel reports that suggests that they've got another facility and they're going after a uranium bomb. The Bush administration confronted the North Koreans about this, and the North Koreans, it, uh, they did not admit it, as some people say they've done, but it was pretty clear that they didn't take much effort to deny it. And so the consequence was the plutonium, the effort against the plutonium to shut down the plutonium uh, uh, reactor ended, and North Korea fired it up again, got it going again, kicked out the international inspectors. They had shut it down, put international inspectors there, kicked all the inspectors out, and started primarily producing plutonium again. The Bush administration wa really wasn't sure what to do about it in its first term when this was all happening. But in the meantime, you had an, a war in Iraq, a war in Afghanistan. And by the second term, President Bush had decided, I've got my hands full in the Middle East. I gotta shut, I've got to make this problem better. So he asked Secretary Rice to, um, he named Secretary Rice as his Secretary of State and asked her to uh, start recruiting people to work on a diplomatic effort, not only directly with, not just directly with the North Koreans as we'd done in the past, but to work with China, with, uh, with South Korea, with, uh, and with Russia and Japan to start having a diplomatic effort, which uh, President uh, uh, Bush called the Six Party Talks, working with China, to get all these countries involved and tried to and trying to uh, shut down uh, North Korea's nuclear ambitions. So in 2000, the summer of 2005, and I'll pick up the pace in a second here. Uh, in 2005, um, I, I had been asked by Secretary Rice to come back from where I had been in South Korea and to uh, head up the U.S. delegation. So I met with the Chinese, the South Koreans, everybody. I thought it was very important to work very closely with the South Koreans. I thought for too long South Koreans had been waiting at airports while we would go and talk to the North Koreans and come back and tell them what happened. I don't think that's the way you treat a country like South Korea. I think we needed to be uh, working with them much more closely than that. We did. And by the, by the f uh, fall of 2005, the, um, we had an agreement 
with the North Koreans to, um, to abandon all their nuclear weapons, to abandon all their nuclear weapons, uh, to return to the non-proliferation treaty. That was very important that it would be there because to return to the treaty means as a non-weapon state. They were not going to join France, Britain, U.S., Russia, and China as weapon state. They were non-weapon states, so be a part of that treaty. So um, that was agreed. Uh, we then had implementing agreements after that. We shut down the plant. We brought in additional uh, uh, inspectors. We brought in a lot of American in inspectors who had a lot of capabilities. Uh, I was telling uh, Klaus's class earlier today, it's good to be on the ground. We have a lot of fun equipment that that through which we can learn a lot about problems provided we have people on the ground and not just relying on satellites 200,000 miles into space. So we brought in all this kind of stuff. We, we blew up the cooling tower. We made it impossible to use this thing. But then we got to the point with the North Koreans, we want a full listing of your programs. They gave us a listing. We looked at them. We didn't see where the uranium enrichment plans had been. I asked them. I said, was this something you started, didn't want to continue? Was it like the Libya model, the famous Libya model, where essentially Gaddafi brought, bought stuff, didn't know what to do with it, left it in his garage for someone else maybe to put together. We finally bought it back from him, very smart move on our part. So did you, did you buy it and then you couldn't handle it? Uh, Kim gae -gwan, my North Korean uh, uh, counterpart, said, no, nope, never had anything to do with it. Now, a lot of people say um, what you look for, what, what you really need in nuclear talks is trust. And uh, I was telling the class today to, to paraphrase Tina Turner, what's trust got to do with it? It's all about verification. And so we went from a kind of incomplete list to, I said, okay, let's look at a complete, uh, at a verification program. How are we going to be able to verify uh, sites that we don't know about today, but we have suspicions about. So uh, at that point, Kim Jong-il, uh, uh, the father of Kim Jong-un, well, Kim Jong-il in the summer of 2008 became Kim Jong very ill. He had some kind of, uh, he had had some kind of health event. We suspect it was a stroke, but he was clearly, we were not getting answers from the North Koreans. So when we finally kind of laid out what we needed at a minimum for a verification uh, regime, we didn't get it from the North Koreans. I called up Secretary Rice. She told me, pack it up. We, we just can't go further. Now, could we have, in the fall of 2008, said, you know, it's, uh, it's half a loaf or half a jar of kimchi. Uh, maybe we should take it try to get on the ground, start doing inspections of various things, and then try to expand the scope of inspection after, you know, we've established uh, some relationships on the ground, et cetera. And I tried that idea out on uh, Secretary Rice, and it was pretty clear. There was so much disgruntlement at the idea of even talking to the North Koreans, even talking to them so much concern in Washington, how could you even talk to these hideous people, that no one wanted to say, okay, we'll take a partial uh, uh, verification regime and try to expand once we're on the ground. So we packed it up, hoping that the Obama administration would unpack it and pick it up. The Obama administration made a couple of efforts at it, not a lot of efforts, because they doubted whether they could really get much further than we, than we did. And I say we, I'm a lifetime, I was a career foreign service officer. I worked for Clinton in the Balkans. I worked for uh, President Obama in Iraq. I worked for George W. Bush on North Korea. But nonetheless, it was sort of my deal. I was very, very engaged in it. So um, to make a long story short, we get to the Trump administration, which is the purpose of this talk. Klaus, if I recall the title. All right, I got it. I'm on it. All right. So, uh, but you know, you just can't do it without knowing what happened before. But anyway, so um, at that point, we, um, we then, uh, the, the Trump administration takes a look at this problem. Well, what had happened since we were last on the ground in Yongbyon? Uh, first of all, North Korea had essentially given up on these liquid fuel missiles uh, and had, had started a whole new generation of solid fuel missiles. So they had the Kwesong, uh, Kwesong, 
think I have it, Kwai Song, 13, 14, 15. 15 was the uh, multi-stage missile. Uh, 14 intermediate, 13 shorter range, but could, so the 13 could still hit Japan. And uh, these were, what was important about this was they were solid fuel. So to understand, if you take a liquid fuel missile, you have to have a specific place to launch it. And because this place has to be able to take extremely dangerous fuel and put it into the missile. So you stand up the missile. It takes hours and hours to put the uh, fuel, and you start uh, fueling up the missile. You remember all those from, from NASA uh, shoots uh, a few years ago where you know, they're fueling up the Apollo rocket, et cetera. It takes a long time. You got, it's a very delicate operation. So during that time, the US can look at that from satellites. Frankly, we can even look at it from periscopes. We have a lot of ways to look at it, and we can say, hmm, should we hit this thing now? Should we let it take off? What should we do? Does it have a nuclear payload? You can start looking at a lot of questions when you have a few hours to look. But a solid fuel missile goes up and off it goes. You get seconds. So there's a whole new threat level just in terms of the missile capabilities of North Korea. And again, you have to go back to the question, well, why do they want this? They are moving very fast and moving very comprehensively with a lot of budget to get this stuff. And by the way, where is it coming from? We still don't know. We suspect privatized uh, Soviet scientists. There are a lot of people. But when, you started, when we started looking at, at uh, sort of supply chain stuff, it was coming from very advanced countries with av advanced electronics who aren't necessarily friends of North Korea. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort that as one country, the U.S., you can't do it on your own. You have to have a lot of friends and allies. I mean, uh, uh, you've got to have a lot of different countries who are kind of looking for this stuff and saying, we suspect that company of selling these transistors to North Korea. Do you want us to shut them down? Yes, we do. And then they go shut them down. I mean, that's the kind of cooperation you need. It's not easy, not easy to get, because a lot of countries say, well, you know, our transistor industry, this is the only industry we've got. If we lose that, we'll lose business or, you know, shut it down. And so it's, it's not easy to do that. But we, we have done a lot of that. And in spite of that, they have some very impressive new, miss, uh, new generation of missiles. And then they have a very impressive, um, uh, what we think is because they had one test in, 2006, a couple tests in 2009, but in recent years, uh, including during the Trump administration, they've actually had some very successful nuclear tests. Whether they can put it on a missile and shoot it off to Los Angeles, hard to say, but uh, it's a lot to worry about. So what are we going to do? Well, President Trump, uh, first of all, tried to scare the North Koreans. And I don't think that stuff worked. Uh, yes, we do have a bigger button than North Korea. Uh, and uh, yes, we do have a much bigger uh, nuclear force than North Korea. And the president pointed that out. But I suspect they already knew that. Um, the real issue, and I give the Trump administration a lot of credit for this, is they continued to work on the sanctions side. Now, we had done a lot of work on sanctions. But every time we were in making some progress on the issue of negotiating with the North Koreans, um, the Chinese would say, you know, is this really a time for a new round, round of sanctions? And you'd say to the Chinese, every day is a good day for a new round of sanctions. You know, this is the language they speak. Let's go after it. Let's continue to go after it. And so the Trump administration, to, to their credit, really went after this and finally got something that those of us who had pushed these sanctions over the years never got. And that was North Korea, despite the fact that they can make nuclear weapons, they cannot make gasoline. And so they're dependent on gasoline from Chinese. And so the Chinese finally took steps to limit their gasoline. Well, whether it was because of that, whether Kim Jong-un was kind of extrapolating more of that to come, uh, whether he just fell out of bed that day with a new thought in his head, it's hard to say, but on January 1st, uh, Kim Jong-un gave his usual blood-curdling speech, but then toward the end of this New Year's address, said something that was kind of unusual. First of all, he noted the South Korean elec uh, elections, 
uh, uh, South Korean uh, Olympics, and said, and we wish them success. Now, at first, I thought that was sort of like a mafia guy saying, oh, you have very nice looking children here. Uh, but, <laughs> but, um, but the context of it was better than that. And it suggested trying to uh, open up some type of avenue with the South Koreans. Well, Kim Jong, uh, well, Moon Jae-in, the South Korean president, who had come in uh, on a kind of platform that he was going to calm things down on the Korean Peninsula. And to understand Korean politics, go back to what I talked about, the division of the Korean Peninsula. The left in Korea is the more nationalist element. They're the ones who are saying it's those foreigners, those foreigners who have divided our country. If they could just leave us alone, we can work things out with our brethren in the north. That's coming from the left in the Korean uh, um, political divide. The right, they tend to be much more internationalist, they tend to want better relations with, the, uh, with Japan, and they consider the number one issue for their country to maintain an excellent relationship with the U.S. So it's a little kind of flip-flopped from most, uh, most countries. So Moon Jae-in comes in as, this, as a leftist South Korean, so-called progressive South Korean president, wanting to see if he can improve things with North Korea and kind of t dial things down and, by the way, have a successful Olympics. Meanwhile, the last two presidents who came from the other political side, uh, the uh, Korean conservative parties, the last not one but two presidents were in jail. Uh, Park Geun-hye uh, was in jail uh, on uh, convicted of corruption charges and Lee myung Bak, before her, was also in jail uh, facing corruption charges. So the, so the kind of right wing in the Korean political spectrum, which is usually the wing that says, hey, you guys got to make sure the U.S. relationship is kept in, in good shape. I mean, it's one thing for you to be talking to the North Koreans, but don't mess up the U.S. relationship. They're gone. They're gone for now, for now. So uh, the South Korean uh, uh, leadership was very anxious to push ahead with this uh, North Korean gambit. They sent a team to Washington. First, they sent a team up to Pyongyang. And sure enough, Kim Jong-un said, you know, in addition to wanting to do a joint uh, Olympic team, I'd like to meet the American president. So the South Koreans took that from Pyongyang, went down to um, Seoul, changed their suitcase, and immediately went off to Washington and met with then National Security Advisor uh, McFar uh, McMaster. So no sooner had they started the meeting with McMaster that uh, President Trump came into McMaster's office knowing that they were there and invited them over to the, to the, uh, to the Oval Office where they told President Trump that uh, we were going to have a, uh, uh, that the North Korean president wants to meet him. And President Trump said immediately, yes, I'll do it. Now, as a, for, as a uh, career diplomat, this is how you normally answer a question like that. You say, thank you so much for conveying that. That is a very interesting proposal. It's a very important proposal. I need to talk to my staff, and, and we need to get you an answer as soon as we can. This is, this is a very crucial issue, and let us have some time. And the other side would, would say, of course, we understand that. Uh, President Trump just said yes on the spot. And then, uh, kind of oddly, and again, I'm speaking as a sort of like a, uh, I mean, as a Foreign Service officer, there are certain things that ought to be done certain ways, and so I'm kind of looking for that. I was not looking for a South Korean official to come out from the, uh, from the uh, uh, West Wing and announce that our president is going to meet with the North Korean president, which is what happened. So um, at that point, the question is, what are we going to do? What's this meeting going to do? They hadn't talked about where they're going to do it yet. But it was pretty clear, the president said, I'm not going to make mistakes that those other, other guys did. So what was the mistake we all made? The mistake we made was to say to the North Koreans, hey, if you do this, we'll do that. And once we do that, we want you to do something else. And when you do the something else, we'll do something else and have step by step. So the president says, no, we're not going to do that. We are going to tell them to do everything, and then, only then, we will give them sanctions relief or whatever else they want. I submit to you that's not what is going to happen, and frankly speaking, that's not what's happening. So we now have a situation where they meet in Singapore, and the piece of paper 
that they signed was far less specific than the piece of paper uh, the Clinton administration has signed and less specific than the one I negotiated in uh, September 2005. It talked about North Korea's desire to eventually uh, end nuclear weapons, but uh, or do away with nuclear weapons, but it kind of leaves you with a sort of biblical sense that somehow, yes, we'll get rid of nuclear weapons when the lambs lie down with the lions, you know, that kind of thing. By the way, if any of you have ever gone to Israel, there is a place where a lamb lies down with a lion. And I asked the guys, how do you do that? And he said, well, we put in a new lamb every day. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's true, there is this place. So. So it was very clear North Korea had a very long-term notion of when this was ever going to happen. Nonetheless, the president moved ahead. And then he did something that I thought was not well advised. He gave a press conference in which he said that the North Koreans, and he didn't even use our term to have joint military exercises with the South Koreans, he called our joint military exercises provocative war games. And so he said, they've asked that we suspend these provocative war games. And uh, we're gonna do, uh, we will do that for the next uh, round. Well, uh, I was watching that with my wife, Julie, and I said, I wonder if he's told the South Koreans that. The answer was he hadn't, he hadn't. And then, the, almost the next sentence was, and we wanna pull our troops, my goal is to pull our troops out of South Korea. And again, I turned to to Julie and I said, do you think he's told the South Koreans that either? And she said, no, I don't think he has. Well, he hadn't, he hadn't. And so it looked like we saw in Singapore a US president announcing the fulfillment of North Korean goals. And so I think we now have a problem. Uh, I did have the opportunity to talk to our very capable and very hardworking Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo, who assured me that things are okay with the South Koreans, that they, they understand we're not pulling our troops out, they're, we're not going to uh, uh, cancel all remaining exercises. At the same time, it's pretty clear that North Korea has not taken any steps to denuclearize. Uh, the North Koreans instead, rather than work from a list, remember I had tried to get a list, we got a list, it didn't include the highly enriched uranium, but it did include a lot of other things. So what you do is you try to get things on the list and say, all right, we'd like you to uh, disable this or, or um, uh, disman dismantle this, et cetera. Again, there was no uh, indication that the North Koreans have been prepared to provide a list, nor any indication that they're going to kind of do away with things that need to be done away with. Uh, so instead, you got these sort of random acts of denuclearization. So suddenly the Pyongyi test site, which we suspected they weren't going to use anymore because it's, hey, it's been the site of six nuclear explosions and the feeling is that the dome created is about to cave in, in which case there'd be a lot of uh, leakage of nuclear effluence, that the North Koreans are abandoning that. Well, good thing, but don't call that denuclearization. I mean, unless it's in a list of things uh, from which you can see, yes, it's part of an overall program. So you get these kind of random acts, but I submit to you it's not serious. Um, there was a, a missile engine facility that they abandoned, so it's, but we weren't asking them to abandon that. So I think the concern that I have is we're not really making any progress yet, but meanwhile, this very uh, left-oriented South Korean government is moving quickly to try to make peninsula relations better. Again, that would be terrific if you saw improvement in the nuclear issue. Instead, you're seeing this penin these peninsula talks go forward while the nuclear talks are absolutely stuck. And I submit to you that the strain between doing these uh, peninsula talks and not making any progress on the nuclear talks will cause problems sooner or later with the South Koreans because at some point the U.S. is going to be concerned about take, dismantling observation posts, for example, on the 38th parallel, one of the issues that they're talking about, without some commensurate uh, uh, improvement of or stand out of North Korean nuclear capabilities. 
So as we, um, as we uh, meet today, I would say uh, we have some serious problems in this. Now, Secretary Pompeo is on his way back to Pyongyang this weekend. Um, he has formed a team. In fact, uh, one piece of advice I had for him was, you shouldn't go unless you know you're going to have something to carry back because secretaries of state never come back empty-handed. That's what lowly assistant secretaries are supposed to do. You know, assistant secretary, you come back, now they didn't give me anything. Well, that's because you're no darn good, but, uh, uh, it, you know, assistant secretaries are expendable, secretaries of state are not. And so I hope that in going to Pyongyang after he had come back from Pyongyang, you recall a couple of months ago, and was accused of using sort of mafia tactics, I would hope that this time he has choreographed it in, ad in advance. You know, diplomacy, you seldom have situations where uh, a president or a secretary of state come and say, okay, everybody, whew, and they pull a rabbit out of a hat and everyone goes, oh my God, look what he just did. Well, you have to remember, rabbits don't live in hats. Someone took a lot of time stuffing that rabbit down the hat, and that's what diplomats do. That's our job, to stuff rabbits down the hat. And so the question is, if, if Pompey is going there, does he have something to pull out of the hat? And if he does, has some work been done to make sure that is ready? And uh, so far, this administration has not in my view, taking the time to understand this kind of trade craft. You have, when two presidents meet, what you do is you send someone ahead and you say, your envoy says, I am delighted that your leader is going to meet with my leader and uh, we are very excited about this upcoming meeting and we have here a draft joint communique that we would like to submit for your consideration. Please feel free to make changes. We're happy to stay here and negotiate the changes, but we would like to have an agreed uh, piece of paper such that when, this meet, when our two leaders meet, we already are absolutely assured of success. That's something this administration doesn't seem to do. And so they seem to do things kind of on the fly with the consequence that that piece of paper that the president and uh, Kim Jong-un uh, signed in, uh, in um, uh, Singapore hadn't been seen by anybody else and hadn't been prepared by anybody. Ideally, again, you want the two presidents to sit down. The piece of paper is already agreed. All they're going to do is sign it at the end. Uh, so it's already fully negotiated. They can just sit and talk about each other's whatever, each other's haircuts, whatever they want to talk about. <laughs> but they, uh, they know that they've already got a success. And so that kind of trade craft, which is very important, uh, doesn't seem to be getting followed. And so the issue of having this kind of diplomatic trade craft to, to do these things, it's not a question of I'm not going to do the same old things and expect a different result. So, the same old things, that is, having, a, um, having an agreement that's already agreed, uh, they are not bad ideas. So you shouldn't think to yourself, you have to change everything to get a different result, because you can change everything and you could get a, an even worse result. So you need to, I think, resort to things that have been tried and tested over the years, and I would hope that there would be, I think, a better understanding of this uh, moving forward. I think Secretary Pompeo is trying to rebuild the State Department, but I'm sorry to say he's trying to rebuild it because why was it destroyed in the first place? I don't understand that. Why did so many of my colleagues leave? Why did they feel they had to leave? So I hope there'll be some effort to really work on these things because I think it's very important for people to understand that America's diplomats, of whom there are thousands uh, of us, uh, we go out to these places and we try to do our country's work and we serve whoever we are, uh, whoever is elected by the American people. And I think there needs to be a greater appreciation of that, not only in the Trump administration, but also among the American people. So I think North Korea is going to be a kind of a, a tough problem for years to come. Uh, Klaus, I think some of your students there are probably going to be grappling with this 10 years from now. But I think we do have a lot of options for dealing with it, but I don't think we have the option of forgetting about it and walking away from it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for a very stimulating, informative, and interesting talk, which uh, has given us lots of food for thought. And I'm sure there are plenty of questions in this very full room. You can see that it's the interest you, of course, uh, by yourself and also by the topic uh, of your talk tonight. Let me just ask you a few questions before we. Let me just get a glass of water, though. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, when we look at the Singapore summit between. Uh, the North Korean leader and President Trump. Of course, the, the paper produced wasn't all that effective and all that detailed as you rightly pointed out. But after all, it was the first time a North Korean leader met with anyone of importance from the West. And he came to Singapore, he even took a plane, and ever since he has been talking to the United States, has been talking to the South Korean leader, and there's talk that he may actually go and see other leaders. So didn't that summit bring him out of isolation? Is North Korea now less of a pariah than it was before? And isn't that good? Because a leader which is pushed into isolation, pushed into a corner, may act much more irrationally than a leader who is trying to get some sort of respect in the international community. Yeah, and I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. That's a very diplomatic way to put it. But I, <laughs> I, um, but I think, but I, I think you know it's been the U.S. policy. We're going to use remember the the term maximum pressure, and uh, that meant we were going to keep them in isolation and sanction them as much as possible. You're making the case for saying, is that a good idea? Should we really isolate them? Couldn't we get more from them by not isolating them? And uh, to which I would answer, you know that. Let's have a discussion about that. Uh, that isolating them could have them in a situation where they just kind of sit by themselves and think even worse thoughts than they had before. I must say I used to deal a lot with this Serbian dictator, uh, Slobodan Milosevic. And when no one had seen him for three weeks, when he had been completely isolated, uh, you would go and see him. He, would be sur he had been surrounded by his uh, very, um, you know, accommodating yes-men staffers, and you'd have to spend the first uh, half of your meeting just talking him down from ideas he had come up with by himself because he had been isolated. So uh, I always felt it was good for him to see a lot of people and be told, no, you can't uh, be murdering Albanians uh, for the rest of your career. Um, but I don't think that discussion has ever taken place with regard to uh, the North Koreans. I don't think there was ever a meeting, in fact, I know there was no meeting in the Trump administration to say, maybe we should forget about isolating him because that makes him worse and try to encourage him to see a lot of other leaders because maybe that will make him better. Again, I, I think there's a respectable point of view to that, but I don't like uh, a situation where we, uh, We've kind of blundered into that situation, into that, uh, um, into getting rid of the isolation, and then trying to uh, explain it um, after the fact by saying, "Well, actually, I think this is better that he's talking to people." If that's the policy, fine, I understand it, but I don't think it's the policy. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let me play devil's advocate. I mean, as you rightly pointed out, it's a big problem to get the North Koreans to denuclearize. It has been a problem for many years. Yeah. The Trump administration, as you rightly pointed out, hasn't really been all that successful so far. Yeah. So, and there are other bad uh, regimes, I would say, who have a nuclear bomb. Let's think of Pakistan. But also other countries have nuclear bombs. Yeah. And we have accepted, the Western world has accepted that that is the case. And Pakistan, as you know, is a you know not an easy country and government sure. yeah. to deal with. So what about saying, okay, North Korea, you can be a nuclear power with certain uh, oversights within certain international regulations. Nuclear weapons power? Exactly. What about that? Would that uh, not uh, calm the situation to some extent, considering that perhaps North Korea will remain a nuclear power anyway? Well. The fact that India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, I don't think was a good day in the, uh, uh, in the history of counterproliferation. Um, they are aiming those nuclear weapons at each other. Uh, it's a kind of, it's a situation where it's stable, if you will. I mean, I have concerns about Pakistan, to be sure. But, um, 
but I think we can see the stability of that. I think to say to the North Koreans, look, we've tried to um, get you to understand you shouldn't have these, but you know we're giving up, you're gonna have them, uh, is to say to South Korea, build nuclear weapons. And I can assure you Japan is not going to be in a situation where South Korea and North Korea have nuclear weapons and Japan doesn't. I mean, remember our line is always, don't worry, you'll have our nuclear umbrella. Well, um, so I think you would end up with Japan going nuclear. And I think you would create probably, uh, you'd create a lot more problems than you would solve. It's a little like arguments that say, well, why don't we just make this adjustment in this border in the Middle East and then all the problems will go away. No, you'll just get a lot of more border adjustments and you'll start another, uh, you'll start more wars. So I would prefer to do the following, which is to say to the North Koreans, um, we are going to come after you as long as it takes, uh, but we are going to make it clear to you and you will understand this at some point that you're, you will have a better future without these weapons than you will have with these weapons. If you open a bank account on the moon, we will fire up the old Apollo and go back there and shut it down. We are not going to allow you to uh, have a, uh, a pleasant day for the, rest of, uh, for the rest of your lives. We are gonna come after you day and night. Uh, if you wanna open a bank account in China, we will work with the Chinese, shut it down. If you have any, if you wanna, sell, uh, if you want to have relations, do something in, in, in Switzerland, we will make sure the Swiss are on you. We will just come after you day and night. If you get rid of, if you agree to get rid of your nuclear weapons, we're prepared to do a lot of things. We're prepared to sequence them as you get rid of yours. Uh, so I think the sequencing is important. The president said we're not going to sequence anything. They have to get rid of it all and then we'll do something. But if they take a meaningful step, we should take a meaningful step. And I think that should be what's on the table, a serious negotiation, one that I think ultimately will help ensure their future such as it is. And by the way, their future will not be cut short by nuclear weapons. It'll be cut short by uh, people who have finally had enough. So I, I think that's the right way. And just to, if we start saying to country X, ah, go ahead and have nuclear weapons, I just don't know when the end of that will be. This sounds like a reasonable solution, but how do you make North Korea believe the United States? You know, Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons or potential nuclear weapons is now dead. Not a good example. <laughs> then the Iran nuclear deal, you know, that the United States, the Trump administration withdrew from it after all the many promises that Iran, you know, would get uh, economic advantages if they stopped uh, their nuclear program. So if I were the North Korean leader, would I believe in any no, uh, American reassurances that they would have a better life if they gave up their nuclear weapons? I think I would also be very skeptical. Uh, that's a fair and in another respect unfair question to ask me uh, because uh, I mean, I accept the premise of what you're saying. Uh, for the president to say the Iran deal is the worst deal ever, well, after Singapore, it slips to a distant second, frankly. Uh, so um, I, I take the point you're making, but I, I think if the North Koreans said, look, we have concerns about whether you're willing to stick with it, that's where, by multilateralizing the arrangement with China, a part of it, with Russia, a part of it. And just as the Iran, just as that is happening in the Iran deal, uh, I think um, North Korea could be assured that we will not um, go back on our arrangements. And by the way, uh, you know, the Iran issue, I, I mean, the president has made very clear he simply wants to remake everything that was done before. So we now have a NAFTA, but it's not called NAFTA. I wouldn't even call it a NAFTA 2.0. I'd call it a NAFTA 1.0001 or something. <laughs> I, I, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we have a president who does want to remake things. I think it's a very bad idea. I would uh, hope Americans can understand that a little better, why it's a bad idea to remake everything. 
But um, if we have presidents who insist on that, that's where we have to have these multilateral deals. And I think uh, countries like Russia and China need to say to the Americans, look, if you change this with the the, you know, whoever, the Sarah Palin administration, uh, uh, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to change this. Uh, so they might want to change their own, uh, they want to change their own, uh, you know, how the agreements are, are done. So I think it's more of a problem, uh, not for North Korea, it's more of a problem for other big players who, pl who play in these international deals. Thank you very much. Let's open it up, this gentleman here. Microphone. Uh, Ambassador Hill, thank you for coming. Uh, could you comment about how the ideology of Juche drives the DPRK regime uh, and psyche, and what the State Department has done in the past and what it could do moving forward to counter its influence? Juche? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to explain to the rest of the people in the room. Uh, it's not a food. It's a... Um, it's a notion of self-sufficiency. Um, do you think I can leave? Do you want to take that microphone? Yeah. 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 Do you, can I leave it at that, a notion of self-sufficiency that kind of strays into a sort of secular religion? Um, again, I, I think it's honored in the breach. I don't think North, I think North Korea uses it as an excuse for why they can't work with anyone else. Uh, they claim they have to have this... Uh, they have to be completely uh, self-sufficient, et cetera. And uh, I don't really believe it. They certainly accepted uh, Soviet help over the years on lots of it. They've accepted Chinese help and lots of it. So when they say, oh, Americans, we can't accept that because it violates our Chuche approach, I, I don't laugh at them because I don't think that's polite. But uh, uh, I, I just don't take them seriously on that point. And, you know, I, I mean, we can't have a sort of North Korean exceptionalism on everything. I mean, I, I know they have odd beginnings, but, you know, a lot of countries have odd stuff in their background. And, and you know, this idea that, oh, we have to accept this because they're North Koreans, I don't buy it. Uh, they still have, you know, two arms and two legs, and they look a lot like human beings to me, and so they ought to start acting like it. Thank you. Uh, this is like, I, I, I'm curious about how integrated the South and the North, to what degree, how family connections, yeah. national connections South Koreans have in North Korea, yeah. North Koreans have in the South. Uh, how concentrated is the regime in Pyongyang? Um, what fraction of it? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's an interesting question because there's more to it than people tend to acknowledge. Uh, there are a lot of families that are, um, that have members on both sides. Uh, Moon Jae-in, actually, the president of South Korea, his family, he has family members in North Korea. So there's a lot of that. Um, and in the chaos uh, of uh, 1950, 51, 52, there were a lot of, you know, partial families who fled South. I'm always skeptical of the population uh, uh, estimates of the South being at about 48 million and North being at tw uh, 23 million. I see, you know, if you go to North Korea, I, was, I went there three times, and uh, the, um, you know, you're driving in, and you know, anyone who's been to Asia, I mean, you you should. If you're, if you're within five miles of a big city, you ought to have teeming masses everywhere, bicycles, scooters, everything. You got zero in North Korea. So it's, uh, I always kind of wonder whether we even know what the uh, population of North Korea is, because they always took this kind of one-third, two-third thing from pre-World War II, and they've never really had a good count since. Um, in terms of the uh, economies or uh, there's nothing and uh, no integration there. And uh, what, you know, the, the Japanese occasionally take credit for industrialization policies on the, uh, on the uh, Korean Peninsula, but they sure didn't knit the two parts of the, uh, of the uh, peninsula together. So I think apart from families, which I think bears analysis and watching, I don't see, I, I don't think there's a lot else there. Thank you very much. Yes, please.
Could you elaborate on the sanctions? Uh, how well have they worked for the future prospects? You know, as a general rule of thumb, I'm not a big sanctions kind of person. I, I was very much involved in the Balkans, and uh, basically what sanctions in the Balkans involved was the um, uh, take transference of wealth from legitimate business to the mafia, and then the fusing of mafia elements to the uh, political elements. So overall, a pretty bad record all for the purpose of changing the mind of the Serb leadership on Bosnia, et cetera. So I, I don't think it really worked well. I can understand it always comes up in the U.S. Uh, sort of toolbox of what to do, because people would ra rather not go to war, but they want to look like they're tough, so then they have sanctions. But the overall track record is not very good. I think in the case of a country like North Korea, um, the concern I have is the same with any sanctions. You end up hurting people that you don't really want to hurt, uh, which is why I think it's important to have carve-outs, big carve-outs for food uh, and, uh, you know, kind of UN-type programs. But, um, you know, I think in North Korea, I just, I, I just look at it as a bad idea whose time has come, you know, that you've got to you got to have sanctions. You got to show you're doing something, and and if you can target stuff that they really need, like gasoline. I mean, I was astounded that they have to have Chinese gasoline, but they do, and so I think that's that's um, worth doing. Um, I would prefer that we, uh, as I said earlier, you know, going after the North Koreans, doing things like uh, inter interdicting supply chains where you can, uh, going after them, and maybe even uh, sabotaging programs. You know, uh, David Sanger of the New York Times has reported that the Obama administration actually um, worked on um, trying to interrupt their missile tests by various cyber warfare. I'm all in favor of that, but I, I think it, we're at a situation with nuclear weapons where we got to try everything we can try. So, this gentleman here. What, uh, how are the China tariffs, the potential of a trade war with China and the, between China and the United States, impacting what's going on between the United States and? Uh, Korea. Yeah. And what do you make of falling in love and the beautiful letters? Yeah. Uh, I just feel there uh, on the second question of whether Trump and Kim Jong Un should be in love with each other or something. I, I have real problems with that. I really do. I, I uh, first of all, th these are huge. There are huge gaps in culture, and so we may think we are engaging in a kind of respect and, uh, and affection for these people that will somehow be reciprocated. And I wouldn't assume that. I, I think uh, these countries don't have that as a, um, you know, the relationship among states in, in these countries as opposed to, say, Westphalian Europe or something where, you know, you might want to um, make some good relationship between country X and country Y, and you might do that by marrying, uh, you know, your princess to their prince, or you know, you, I mean, there are a lot of ways that things have emerged in Europe uh, that I just don't think are really available in Asia, where I think the relationship, especially China's relationship with states, but also I think this applies to any country in Asia, where you know you you don't have these kind of one sovereign to another sovereign type relationships. It's, much, it's more complicated than that, sometimes tributary states. So you bring a gift to another state and are you, is that an act of kindness or an act of, uh, or an act of weakness? And so I think uh, if, if you haven't really looked through the cultural antecedents of all this, you could be engaging in acts of weakness when you think you're being uh, restrained or kind, let's say. So, yeah, I have a, I have a lot of concerns about that. And the first part of the question? The, the potential trade war between China Yeah, I mean, the problem, well, I think there are a lot of problems with trade wars, but one of the problems is they go kind of uh, mainlined right into public mood. 
Um, so if you're some Chinese factory and, and you're being affected by this, boom, I mean, you really feel it. If you're an American farmer, you start really feeling it. Um, and I, I don't think we've thought this stuff through. I really don't. I mean, with due respect to this guy, Navarro, who I never heard of before, but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, our soybean, soybean farmers in the U.S. had um, planted their crops post to post. I mean, they had planted a big soybean uh, crop. Um, I don't think President Trump really looked carefully at that before hitting the Chinese with the first of the $50, $50 billion goods of, of, um, of tariffs, which I think was the, also included the iron and steel at the time. So the Chinese then hit us with a 10% tariff on soybeans. And I remember thinking, wow, 10%, uh, you know, we're ahead if you look at this like it's a football score or something. And, uh, but I didn't understand that what has happened is the soy market, which is very, you know, market sense, commodity trade market sensitive, goes down 25%. So our farmers are looking at a soybean crop that's 25% worth uh, less than it was than the prevailing market price. Now, the Europeans have now bought a lot of that soybean crop. That's, that's brought the price of the crop up. You know, it's not suffering the whole 25%. It's brought it up some, some. But then the Europeans are turning around and selling it to the Chinese. And so the Chinese are, let's say it's 20% down, because it went down 25, and I think when the Europeans started getting into the market, it went up about five. So let's call it 20% down. So the Chinese are getting soybeans 20% less than they did before all this start, uh, happened. They're happy, the Europeans are happy, and I'm not sure how I'd feel if I lived in Iowa growing uh, soybeans. And so I just have a problem with people not thinking things through. You know, I, I just feel, you know, this public policy business, this is serious stuff. And, you know, we need people to really understand what they're doing when they do stuff like this. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, follow up on that. When you look at the fraud relationship... That's piling on, not following up, but go ahead. <laughs> you can take it, I know. Yeah. <laughs> let me ask you. Uh, when you look at the relation, the trade relationship between the United States and South Korea, which has all also not been easy, has been fraught with difficulties in the recent uh, past, has that had an impact on policy towards North Korea of both countries? I think um, no. I think the uh, while we were working very closely with the tr South Koreans on North Korea. We were engaged in the negotiation of Corus, the uh, Korea-U.S. Uh, uh, free trade agreement. Uh, this was during the Bush administration, and of course, Corus was finally it was finalized during the um, o during the Obama administration. Um, I think it went pretty well. Uh, when the president started indicating that we were that Corus was a terrible deal, he didn't call it the worst deal, but you know, he led people to believe he was thinking that way. I think our trade people, including in the Trump administration, did a good job to get it done. And so, with a few moderate, moderate changes, uh, I think we're in good shape now with the uh, uh, arrangements on course. For example, I mean, I, I'm not kidding. Uh, we, we had an agreement with uh, South Koreans to bring in 100,000 American cars that would not be subject to South Korean safety regulations and make it impossible for a U.S. manufacturer essentially to tinker with, uh, uh, you know, that kind of size of that kind of market. So, um, unfortunately, our car manufacturers don't want to sell in, in Korea, so we've never filled more than a third I think it's a third and, uh, of the, the, the U.S. cars that have a right to go to Korea without modifications for safety. We've never even filled a third of that. And now this new chorus agreement allows us to send 200,000 cars, even though we've never sent a third of 100,000 cars. So at some point you have to say, guys, this is serious business and stop playing with people on this. 
And so I, uh, and there, there are a couple of other issues. And, you know, I don't rule out the possibility that there are some tweaks to the chorus deal that make it a little better for us this time. But I'll bet it's better for the South Koreans. And so I, I think a lot of this trade stuff is, dare I say it, politics. <laughs> and, uh, and as for North Korea, uh, I don't think, I mean, my sense is that's just a whole different game and that's a serious game. So there's no linkage between the I have, trade. I have not seen that kind of linkage. Now, there were issues, and they may come up again as a result of this uh, rapprochement with, uh, with uh, North Korea. There, there's a facility uh, in North Korea run by the South Koreans called the Kaesong Industrial Facility. So Kaesong was essentially a means to take South Korean light industry, which was getting hit very hard by Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, all the other countries lower down on the wage scales. And so the South Korean industry, and this is a lot of kind of Pusan type based in southern South Korea. So what they, um, they were able to get a new lease on life by producing pots and pans with North Korean workers. And so uh, they were able to keep their light industries going and competitive against Vietnam, uh, even though South Korean labor just is way above the cost of Vietnamese labor. So that all came to an end a few years ago when President Park Geun-hye of South Korea, now in jail, uh, had uh, pulled the plug on Kaesong. So, um, par, uh, so Moon Jae-in says he is going to revive Kaesong and then the question will be, because we faced this before, if Kaesong starts really producing a lot of pots and pans, uh, will, the, will the South Koreans look for a window through the chorus, through the free trade agreement, to sell these to the U.S.? So, and would our authorities want Americans to start buying pots and pans in, uh, in, uh, that are made in, <laughs> essentially made in North Korea? So there'll be issues like that, but so far, not. So I know you mentioned a lot of the current security implications of why China would not want the U.S. Army on the Korean Peninsula. But isn't it true that culturally the Chinese have always controlled North Korea even before the People's Republic of China? It wouldn't have, would those not only be reasons for why the Chinese would want you to continue to control North Korean politics and culture? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment that they would want to continue to be the main player in North Korea. And I don't think they're going to be uh, satisfied with getting sort of secondhand reports from us on how we're doing with the North Koreans. Sadly, I think one of the concrete results of Singapore has been we've strengthened North Korean Chinese relations. After all, they hadn't, uh, the president of North Korea and the president of China had not met. The North Korean had not made, uh, Kim Jong un had made zero trips to China until the whole Singapore process was announced, and now he's made about three of them, uh, last I checked. So um, I think China has a, a major interest there. Um, I don't accept the pr uh, premise that somehow it's China's right to do whatever they want in North Korea. I, I, uh, I know the historical circumstances, but I don't accept that they have the right to somehow interfere in North Korea. Um, and uh, I think, the Chinese, I'd like to hear a clearer affirmation from the Chinese that if the Korean people wanted to unite, that they would support it. Um, and we don't hear that too often from the Chinese. So I think, uh, I, I think the premise of your question is absolutely right. China has a, has a great interest, and I don't think we should be ignoring that interest. And I think my whole concern with the whole Singapore fling was that the, uh, that there was not sufficient um, sort of uh, diplomatic game. You know, we needed to be very clear with the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, what we're going to, how we're going to do, how we're going to get them involved in this. I think there needs to be more of an architecture, if you will, there. One, th one thing is for sure, after this talk tonight, President Trump is unlikely to ring up and offer you a job. No, I don't think that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> yes, this, uh, Um, in, during, during your talk, you kind of briefly mentioned how Mike Pompeo was working to rebuild the State Department, and yeah. also you mentioned how some of your colleagues had like 
recently uh, quit or not had some yeah. experiences. I, I maybe that's an implication, but uh, um, I was just curious if you could maybe provide some insight about like the changes in the State Department culture since you have been in it versus how it is now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I joined uh, eons ago. I, I, I entered uh, um, in October 1977, and I left in, um, in uh, September 2010. So a lot happened in those years. Um, I feel uh, if you look at 191 countries, no one has as high a percentage of political appointees than the United States. I think we're number one in that regard. And again, there are some pretty brilliant political appointees. Um, Henry Kissinger, for starters. Uh, uh, I think there are some really brilliant political appointees. But I think we've gone a little too far on that. And I think, unfortunately, ambassadorships are part of a broader problem in our society of uh, funding political campaigns. And so uh, I think when you signal that somehow an ambassadorship is for, is for sale, um, the question becomes what else is for sale? What else do you have for sale here? And so I worry about that. And in answer to your question, I think it's gotten worse over the years. And I see, I think if you look at the percentages, it's getting worse. Now, I, by the way, anyone who's read the, the brilliant book by Chernoff about uh, Ulysses Grant uh, sees that he was making appointments of various eminent people to do uh, ambassadorships. So th this tradition of reaching outside the career foreign service to get ambassadorships is not new and it's not necessarily bad. But um, I th just think it's way too tied now to campaign financing, and I think that's a problem. And that's something I've seen over the years. Um, people often think, well, isn't it now true that in, a, uh, in an age of instant communication that you have, uh, that you, have um, uh, you know, embassies are kind of irrelevant? And I don't think that's true at all, and here's why. <laughs> it's because this instant communication you will have a situation where it's sort of like a little league soccer team. Everyone's following the ball because the ball is right out there. And then who's, who's minding the other places? And the answer is embassies are. So ironically, the communications has kind of uh, uh, reinforced the notion that you only follow one event at a time. Well, now no one's following anything because of the Matt Cavanaugh business. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, <laughs> But, you know, even when you have one foreign service issue, you know, there are 190 other countries and, and, and it's only the embassies who are following that. So I think, uh, I, I don't think communications have uh, messed up the role of, uh, of the foreign service in, in, you know, doing the Lord's work out there. Uh, to some extent, you get a little more micromanaging from, uh, from Washington. I mean, they didn't... They don't quite fit you with, uh, you know, helmet cams as you go into, uh, into, uh, you know, prime minister's office. But they might call you just before you go in and just after you come out, and you know, it's almost like you go, well, here you talk to them, you know. Uh, so there's there's that going on. But I, I still don't think there's any substitution for the uh, judgment of a, of a of an American diplomat who knows the country and is dealing with the with the issues out there. And then one other issue is uh, it's not just the State Department uh, conducting foreign policy. It's not just the Defense Department. You, you got Treasury, you got Commerce. It's just uh, you got everybody with an opinion on something. And so um, uh, the, the days when the State Department could say, hey, this is our business, get out of here, those are gone. So you've got to have build alliances in Washington if you're going to be effective in, in doing your job. So a lot of things have, have happened, but uh, one thing has not changed is when, Amer when an American ambassador walks into a room, people stop and listen. I mean, we are still it. And I don't care who says, oh, this is somehow the you know, century of China or whatever. No, it isn't. We're it. And uh, I think it behooves us to understand that better and to, as citizens, be much better informed than we, uh, than we sometimes are. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So 
So I believe you mentioned um, a couple different times about how strong of an interest China has in keeping North Korea in power is to a stable situation. How can the U.S. try to work towards getting Chinese cooperation um, with things like sanctions? Would that be best through the U.N. or inside China that they could also be harmed? Or what would you think be the most effective way? I think we have to have a much more comprehensive dialogue with the Chinese. Uh, and not just through the, I think our ambassador in Beijing, good guy by all accounts, the former governor of Iowa, but uh, I, I think we really need a sort of envoy who works nonstop with the Chinese on these regional security questions, namely North Korea. And, um, you know, and diplomacy is sort of like advertising. If you haven't said it 50 times, you haven't said it at all, so you, you gotta kinda keep at it. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of scope there for overcoming this sort of mountain of mistrust that exists now with China. Now look, China is not for the faint of heart. It's tough. But if you think it's tough working with China, try working against China. And uh, I, th I think we need to kind of understand that we got a big player there that has real interests in this issue and we need to work with them. And I don't think there was nearly enough of that uh, in this whole Singapore process. Can you see that the trade war has actually influenced uh, China's uh, cooperation or non-cooperation on North Korea? I don't think the trade war has helped us at all on North Korea. How much it's uh, made it more difficult is hard to say, but um, again, the trouble with trade wars is they become very public very quickly and you, when you start getting the publics involved, you kind of limit the scope of foreign ministries or or security agencies to, to work with one another. And so I do worry about that. Good evening, Mr. Ambassador. My question pertains to when you're the ambassador for South Korea. How would you categorize your relationship with the four star American commander that was also on the peninsula, as well as the geographical combat commander for the Pacific? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm from uh, Little Compton, Rhode Island, and the uh, four star uh, Leon Laporte was from. Uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island. I remember our, our senator, uh, Jack Reed, saying, you know, you guys should open a Dell's frozen lemonade place. I mean, the statistical probability of two Rhode Islanders uh, uh, working together in Korea. Um, so I had a great uh, experience with, uh, with Leon uh, and uh, with Leon Laporte. Uh, I think we worked very well together. Uh, we met all the time. Uh, we stayed out of each other's lanes. I didn't tell him, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether to have, you know, B-52s during doing a flyover or not. If he felt he needed them for the uh, team spirit exercise or something, that was his call. Uh, he didn't tell me who to meet in the, uh, you know, Korean uh, apparatus. Uh, we were respectful of each other's roles. And I, I think that is the way to go. I will tell you, however, uh, oh, and as for the Pacific Commander, not uh, a problem for me. I do sometimes think there have been issues between four-star uh, admirals in Honolulu and four-star army uh, generals in, uh, in Korea. Uh, there have been kind of problems on how to do those things, but I've never seen something spill out and be a complete mess or something. Now, however, in addition to the four-star admiral in uh, Honolulu and the four-star army general in uh, Yongsan, uh, in southern Seoul, the U.S. ambassador is a political appointee who's a four-star naval admiral. So you have a four-star admiral in, in Honolulu, a four-star admiral in Seoul, and a four-star army general in um, Yongsan. Uh, that may be few more stars than you'd like to see in that situation, I don't know. But uh, they have to sort that out, and so far I, I haven't seen any problems. I must though, uh, you know, when you talk about, this is a key question about civil-military relations, because a lot of these issues we're in, you know, you, you're not going to go to, you know, f these phases of ending conflict and then uh, peace operations, et cetera. You know, these phases, phases all kind of bleed into each other, sometimes literally. And so um, I think uh, civilians have got to uh, work closely with the military, shoulder to shoulder. 
but the same goes for the military. So there need to be um, kind of a better um, uh, an understanding of each other's cultures. Now what we tried to do in, in Iraq, for example, uh, the military had something called a J-9. I had never heard of a J-9 before. Uh, a J-9, you know, you, everyone knows about J-2, the intel, or, uh, or you know, J-3 or J-5, the plans, et cetera, strategic plans. Well, J-9 was so-called civilian interface. So essentially the military had its own civilian em interface. So I said to the general, I said, well, what's that? Uh, why call it a civilian interface? Why don't you just call it another embassy? Uh, and so, you know, we sorted that out. And you know how we eventually resolved it? We took the J-9 and abolished it and put all the uh, army, uh, all the military people into the embassy, into the political and economic sections. So I, I think uh, it's going to be, it's, it's not easy. And anyone who says this is easy, I mean, the military has been struggling with Goldwater Nichols for years, and that had nothing to do with civilians. That had to do with jointness uh, among the various services. So now we have another element of civilians and military. And look, we're a great country. We can sort this out. Haven't our military moved out of Pyongyang in the last few months? Uh, it's happening, and they are moving to Pyongyang. It's taken 20 years. By the way, the Koreans are are making most of this. I mean, uh, so they are, they are facilitating this. And I think when they finally move to Piontek, it will enable the embassy to move to a location called Camp Coiner on the edge of uh, the Yongsan base, and we'll have a new embassy. So there are a lot of sort of muscle moves, but you're absolutely right, it is happening. Thank you. Can you briefly comment on the uh, importance of that happening? I think most of us don't know. Oh, well. Yongsan was a, was a sort of military outpost. Uh, and then in the intervening um, five, six decades, Yongsan is now right in the middle of Seoul. It's right in the middle of one of the most densely populated places in the world. So it would be like uh, having a foreign uh, uh, military in uh, Central Park. Uh, with uh, just everything around it, enormous buildings. In the middle, you have this, uh, uh, this foreign military base. So it's been, uh, for many years, a need to kind of get these, uh, get military base, which should not be in the center of a city, and get them out. But it's taken a long time. Uh, but I think it's, it's going to happen. Already parts of Yongsan base, like they got rid of the golf course a long time ago, which was a good thing because poor Koreans would be up on this one of these commuter bridges over the Han River, and you're stuck in traffic and you're looking out, out in the front and you see these American military uh, officers playing golf uh, where a highway should be going. So, I mean, there are a lot of problems with it, but I think it's, uh, things are getting better and it's getting done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.